please welcome Cleveland Clinic CEO and President, Dr. Toby Cosgrove. Well, good evening. I'm delighted to have you all here. Uh, I just want to tell you about our next speaker before we introduce the speaker for today. Melissa Mayer, uh, the CEO of Yahoo, uh, will be here uh, next year uh, at a date yet to be determined, and we'll keep you posted on that date and when it's coming up. Norman Foster is one of the world's preeminent architects and designers. His vision has tr transformed the way we see and use the world, from London to Beijing and now to Cleveland. I first met Norman Foster in 2003 in England. Cleveland Clinic was considering establishing a presence in London, and Norman gave us a presentation in his studio. I was impressed by the breadth of his outlook on cities and buildings. I realized that I had met someone who would be capable of planning the future shape of our main campus. Today, Norman Foster is a citizen of the world. He was born in the heart of industrial England. He grew up surrounded by engineering and manufacturing. He worked as a baker, bouncer, and furniture salesman before studying architecture. In 1963, he co-founded the award-winning architectural group Team Four. Their work included the futuristic home used in the movie Clockwork Orange. The firm is now known as Foster & Partners, was established in 1967. They have received more than 190 awards and citations of excellence and won over 50 national and international competitions. Norman makes sure that the firm keeps a young outlook. The average age of their architects, architects is 32, the same as when it was founded. Norman was a close friend of the legendary uh, designer Buckminster Fuller. And like Fuller, he and his team have designed a whole range of human activities, from boats to bathtubs. Foster and Partner has left an indelib indelible imprint on the world. They designed the world's largest single building, the Beijing Airport, and the world's tallest bridge in southern France. They are creating a circular headquarters for Apple in Cupertino, California, and a zero carbon, zero waste city in Abu Dhabi. Norman was honored with a life peerage in the Queen's birthday honors list in 1999. He took the title Lord Foster of Thames Bank. In 2012, we selected Foster & Partners to create a 20-year growth plan for our main campus. They identified sites for as many as 14 new buildings around a green spine of a park-like mall. Their plan gives us a more coherent and navigable campus and a roadmap for future development. Now Norman and his team are giving us another iconic design our health education campus. It is a building that will transform and de uh, define the shape of medical education for the years and years to come. As an architect, you design for the present with an awareness of the past for a future which is essentially unknown. Lord Norman Foster was an only child born after the Great Depression. Growing up in Manchester, England, he became fascinated with engineering and the process of design. I think he's the most self-motivated person I've ever met. He has a passion for architecture. After serving in the Royal Air Force in 1953, he attended the University of Manchester School of Architecture and City Planning. Foster came to the United States after winning the Henry Fellowship to the Yale School of Architecture. He earned his master's degree and returned to the UK armed with ideas that would change the world of architecture. In 1964, he joined Richard Rogers to form Team Four with Wendy Cheeseman, who later became his wife, and her sister, Georgie Woolton. Then in 1967, 
He and his wife, Wendy, founded Foster Associates, later to become Foster & Partners, which still operates today as an international studio with projects on six continents. Originally focused on industrial buildings, Foster's breakthrough design came in 1974. The Willis Faber and Dumas headquarters in Ipswich, constructed in black glass, taking on the shape of a baby grand piano. I called Foster the Mozart of modernism. The way his work seems sort of lyrical, elegant, and effortless. Foster gained a reputation for pioneering designs, making his own rules and setting new trends. Throughout five decades of design, his work has become more than bricks and blueprints. He preserved history in the Reichstag in Germany, designed the largest building on the planet, the airport in Beijing, created the tallest bridge in the world in France, and fashioned iconic images in the London skyline with Wembley Stadium and the so-called Gherkin, Swiss Re's London headquarters. Lines and light play a part in Foster's building plans, but he also takes an environmentally sensitive approach to design with the use of airflow and materials. Green is cool. All the projects which have been inspired by that agenda are about celebrating the places and the spaces which determine the quality of life. Lord Foster is one of the most prolific architects of his generation. He was awarded the Pritzker Architecture Prize, often referred to as the Nobel Prize of Architecture. He has created magnificent structures, transforming skylines for the world today. But even more lasting is his philosophy that will help define and reinvent the architecture of tomorrow. Join me in welcoming Lord Norman Foster. Such a film. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. I did this sketch to remind myself that for me, architecture is about working with space, with light, with structure, to connect with nature, to make settings, environments, which encourage connectivity, community, and creativity. And in planning for the future, um, I find it helpful to look back to the past um, and to connect with other worlds of technology, particularly flight. And these are the themes that I'd like to share uh, and explore this evening. Um, I started this talk on my daily bike ride and um, this is the bike. And for me, it's a, a kind of icon, a cult object, a very beautiful object. It gives me great pleasure. It gives me exercise. It gives me freedom um, and quiet to be able to think. So I really started this talk on my bike in the countryside around my home. And it reminded me that um, it's something like 120 years uh, since the bike was invented. And, um, and that Ohio was around 1890, 1900, uh, one of the biggest producers of bicycles. And you can see that 1896, when this state-of-the-art bike, which was designed and produced by the Wright brothers, um, is essentially the same design. The materials of the modern bike um, are more sophisticated, lighter, stronger perhaps, but essentially it is the same creation. And here you can see uh, that Van Cleve bike, of 1896, 
in the window of the Wright Brothers cycle shop. And it was in the workshop at the back that they would make these bicycles. And eventually, it was the same workshop that produced their gliders and experimental um, aircraft. And um, if they turned around, this would be Wilbur and Orville, one the designer, the other the realizer, the maker. And the bicycle was used by them for experiments to measure the resistance of air. And the flying creations um, are directly derived from the technology of the bicycle. Here you can see the, the crank wheel, the chains, and the frame of the aircraft, which is, um, which is the tubes of, uh, of a bicycle. And that canard configuration with the horizontal stabilizer at the front, which enabled the pioneering flights um, here in Ohio, um, also served the designer Paul McCready to go back to first principles, to learn from the past that the challenge of man-powered and solar-assisted flight, and again, the bicycle analogies are very, very clear, was possible by going back to the early Wright Flyer of 1903. Um, Moving forward um, some uh, to the end of the 20th century, um, this uh, solar impulse, uh, we, can, we can see in some ways the clues for the way that buildings might go. At the moment, if you think of solar cells, they are retrofitted onto, uh, onto buildings. Here we see that the solar cells have become a part of the aerodynamic surface, a part of the structure. And I think it's inevitable that that will happen in terms of building components and facades. The more sophisticated version of this will be, uh, is now being prepared for um, a round-the-world non-stop uh, flight. Uh, the combination of technologies now makes that possible. It's quite interesting that on the 9th of October 1903, in terms of predictions, the flying machine which will really fly might be evolved by the combined and continuous efforts of mathematicians and me me mechanicians in from 1 million to 10 million years. It was the same day that Orville Wright wrote in his diary, we started assembly today. And, um, and who could have guessed that in less than 100 years' time that this is what the aerial highways of the world would look like? So in the last 24 hours, more than 8 million people have been aloft and at the end of a typical year, that adds, adds up in terms of passenger miles to something like 750 billion passenger miles. Um, and that growth is, is, still, uh, is still increasing. Um, one estimate is that it's doubling in terms of airport capacity twice every 15 years. And there's a stark comparison between the beauty of the modern aircraft and the destinations which receive it. And Heathrow is not untypical of many airports which have grown up over time. If you half close your eyes, it looks more like an industrial estate with aircraft attached to it. So if it has the kind of industrial estate look on the outside, then the inside is, uh, is often sheer misery. And, um, and I, I asked for some 
research on the stress, whether anybody had done any studies about the stress of, uh, of, the, of the airport. And um, I discovered that a Dr. David Lewis in 2007 attached some heart monitors to a small group going through Heathrow to take a flight to Amsterdam. And, um, and it registered more than 200 uh, beats per minute. And if you compare that with marathon runners and uh, combat pilots and free fall parachutists and firefighters and riot police facing possible death, they're all <laughs> less. So I think you could say that your typical modern airport can be somewhat dangerous for your health and might uh, ought to carry a, a warning. So, um, <coughs> and here again, uh, this, now if I go back to the 1990s, um, was very much typical, and is still typical of many airports. You look at it and you don't really know whether it's a shopping mall with aircraft attached to it, but you can't see them anywhere. So, um, and this was the time that we were asked to rethink, create a new generation airport. And, um, and as a consequence of that, I think it's true to say we essentially reinvented the, the airport as a building type. And as a, as a keen pilot, at that time I uh, recalled that the, for me, the most interesting airports, the airports I enjoyed most were the very simple ones, the early ones, where you had a sense of orientation, where you could look out of a window and you'd see an aircraft um, and you'd walk towards the aircraft. And, uh, and somehow, with all the complexity, that magic, that glamour had been lost. So, um, so the model, the inspiration, was to look back to the past and see what lessons one might learn from it. And, um, and that kind of more glamorous past is here captured in the 1930s by the very first airport hotel, which was at Dearborn. And, um, and quite interesting, I hadn't realized it at the time, but if, I, if I'd done more research, the model that I would have picked would have been Dearborn Airport, because it was the first of so many things, not just the first hotel, was also the first uh, tarmac runway, which you can see in the background here. It was the first scheduled um, flights for passengers. It was the first scheduled contract um, postal uh, airline. Um, the first radio controlled um, uh, flights. So many, many firsts and very much a part of the, of the Midwest. If you look closer at those aircraft and the facility, um, it's a Ford facility. So I hadn't realized the role in which in early aviation, if you like, the birth of the terminal as we know it and everything about flying, owes a great deal to the automobile uh, industry. So how did we interpret some of those inspirations from the past? Well, if this is a kind of cross-section through the typical airport and, um, and you see that the roof is full of mechanical equipment, which is pulsating air and stuff through the building. And of course, it's completely uh, a solid mass on the, on the roof. And effectively, what we did was to turn that upside down. So all that heavy stuff which is sitting up on the roof, out in the weather, difficult to get out, difficult to maintain, we put it in an undercroft below and then just fed all the air and everything from below. And that opened up the roof to be able to see the sky, to get sunlight through, dramatic reduction in energy because it comes for free um, and has more benefits because when you have to light everything in a dark box with electric light, then that generates heat, so you've got to put in more energy to cool it, take away the heat, and you don't get any views. So this um, new generation rethink, reinvention for London's third airport 
was about that. It was about views, it was about sun, it was about uh, joy. And um, we went on to develop those, and it's become a model which has been adopted by architects and airport planners ever since, with many variations on the theme, but essentially the same idea. I call it an analog building in a digital age, age because you have there's this contact with the outside. You have this sense of, of orientation. It is more friendly. And I then got to wonder if there was any way that you could quantify this. Of course you can't, but I think there are some interesting coincidences, more than coincidences. Since, that, since Hong Kong Airport came into operation, um, airports worldwide are tracked in terms of their performance by a body called Skytrax, based in the UK. And they do approaching 13 million surveys a year, different nationalities. They scan about 410 airports worldwide. And Hong Kong, out of the last 14 years, has picked up the best, the most popular airport with the traveling customer. Um, and interestingly, the, the other uh, contenders uh, who've come first place in the remaining uh, six years has been um, uh, Singapore and Seoul. And, um, and again, you can see in the images there that they're very much about the same qualities. So it's not a, an objective survey. There are some things you can't measure about, uh, about the quality of an environment. But I think here it's clear that it is a major factor in terms of the uh, the well-being and the satisfaction of the, of the travelling passenger. We went on to do, as I saw in the film, um, Beijing Airport, which um, is kind of aerodynamic looking on plan, um, but the locals have their own interpretations of the way that they read that in terms of its coloration, which is very deliberately of the range of colours that you would associate with China. So a state-of-the-art airport on a vast, epic scale, the whole thing realised in an extraordinary five-month uh, design and build period. But evocative of the roof colour of the uh, Forbidden City, the locals see it as dragon-like with its scales. Um, so that building, which is the largest building in the world, um, also tempted me, and I was fortunate enough to be able to see it this afternoon, to visit what in 1929 was the largest uninterrupted volume building of its time, which is the uh, Goodyear Air Dock at Akron. Um, an extraordinary <laughs> achievement, and I could spend all, after, all evening talking about this building with its more than 600 tonne doors, which... Uh, which open, um, but um, but the uh, the internal structure of the very beautiful streamlined shape of the of the airship is also evocative of for me um, the pioneers of structure, whether it's Barnes Wallace at the time in in Britain, Buckminster Fuller, and again. On my way here, I visited this. This is the headquarters of ASM, not too far from here. Very beautiful uh, geodesic uh, structure. And, um, and again, that was for me a, a pilgrimage because for the last 12 years of his life, I collaborated with Buckminster Fuller and his then partner, Thomas Sung, who's here this evening. And, um, and we... Uh, we kind of had the dream that, uh, that some of uh, those ideas would be realised and uh, on, on a great scale. And it's quite interesting that, um, that now, so many years later, the technology has advanced to the extent that we can contemplate that. And this short film here shows our project for Mexico Airport, which is... Uh, has that gossamer-like, incredibly uh, lightweight structure developed um, from a similar technology, but
but with the ability now to be able to calculate more complex shapes with computers. And here, um, this is perhaps the next phase in our terms of how we would seek to reinvent the airport again. And if the examples that I'd shown you before that we'd done, they would have a horizontal roof, they would have vertical walls, variations on that. And a typical span of the columns would probably be uh, something like 120 uh, feet. Here, the spans have gone right up to 600 feet. And there are not columns, it's a continuous um, membrane. And I realized as I was thinking on my bicycle ab about, uh, about some of the past, and the past perhaps evoked by images uh, of an earlier uh, period, that as a student, this is, I took this in 1959, it's the uh, Galleria in, in Milan, Vittorio Emanuele. Um, and, um, and those cast iron structures of the time, it's quite interesting, I haven't seen this yet, but you have an arcade which was in turn inspired at the end of the 19th century um, here in, in, in Cleveland based on, on that model. And uh, those inspirations um, uh, from the past have informed a range of lightweight enclosures where we've been able to transform and give a new round-the-year life to spaces. Here, this is the courtyard of the patent building in Washington, now the Smithsonian, and that is the Kogod uh, courtyard, which uh, has a whole range of possibilities from music to teaching to grouping, a similar um, in the same vein. Uh, the British Museum, at its heart, was a courtyard um, in the early uh, 19th century. And, um, and that became filled in with a great circular library and rather um, storage spaces around it, which filled the courtyard. So our project there was, again, inspired by the past to rediscover the essence of the courtyard. And so by taking away all those storage areas that had built up around it, roofing it, keeping the six million a year visitors active and flowing through it to transform and create a space which was very much um, about culture and, um, and a kind of inside-outside space, an urban space, an urban, uh, an urban room. And, um, and it's interesting that if you, if you consider the role of the courtyard, a very traditional device, and you link that to the cloister, then that is the birth of the hospital as we know it today. All the early examples, and I visited this building in Toledo, it's now a a series of, uh, of art galleries, but very, very clearly you can see historically uh, it's, um, it, it, the way in which it's been derived from uh, an early medical building. And again, the history is very much of courtyards and cloisters, which brings us to, uh, to now and uh, variations on the same on the same themes. Here we see the east-west axis of the, of the master plan and the idea of making connections, inserting new buildings with old buildings, um, being inspired by the city grid of streets which go back some uh, several hundred years and, um, and a lot of greenery, green roofs that you would look down upon. And, um, and one site uh, there, which is this site, oh, excuse me, uh, is here, um, for the building that was mentioned earlier. And, um, and looking at the evolution of that design, and it starts off as a series of individual buildings around uh, a courtyard, the unifying idea of a perimeter roof, which will... Uh, which will visually bring them together and offer protection. And, um, and in its final development, it becomes more compact 
and the four separate schools, the three case university, um, the school of medicine, of dentists, of nursing, um, and, the, um, and the college of, 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 of medicine, the learner college, uh, from the clinic here coming together under, under one roof and, um, and for, to encourage cross-fertilization, collaboration between the different disciplines to break down those barriers, to create a building which is more sustainable, which is more creative, and to bring in natural light into the heart of this. And so very much a response to the, the needs, the education needs, uh, the professional needs, the climate, um, and the grid. So it's very much about, uh, about light, about joy. Um, each corner would be occupied by one of these schools, and then the connecting spaces are the shared amenity spaces, and where the maximum social interaction takes place at the ground level with the cafeteria, with the lecture rooms and so on, the maximum activity, um, that, would, um, that would be the kind of social heart, the social uh, focus of the, of the project. And again, very much under, um, under, under development. Here we can see the cross-section, the top light, the way in which the, uh, the lower floor with the plant rooms and the way in which uh, natural ventilation, a degree of that would be en en encouraged, and natural air movement through the, through the central space. Which, again, all of these projects, although they're very different in their nature, their function, their locality, they do share a common uh, philosophy, which is about um, a degree of sustainability, working with, 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 with nature, natural ventilation, putting light deep into the heart of a building, and, and creating an opportunity to celebrate with public space, with views of the surroundings. And here you can see the mirror which deflects light deep down into the chamber below and gives a new relationship between the public and their elected politicians who are symbolically uh, below them there. Um, <coughs> The, uh, the similar principles have, um, have encouraged us with progressive clients, as in Hearst Corporation here, to be able to, uh, to produce buildings which have set uh, new standards. This is the first building in New York City, in Manhattan, to have a LEED Platinum uh, rating. And, Everything is working together here. The kind of waterfall that you, um, that you glide past as you rise into this communal space, um, that is part of the system of collecting rainwater on the roof, storing it in a 14,000-gallon uh, tank below, recycling that water. And unlike um, this area, which is more extreme in terms of its climate, in New York, you can work with air at ambient temperatures for something like 75% um, of, the, of the year. So um, this is achieving an energy saving of something like 26% uh, better than the building code standard. So it's, it's, going, it's, it's going very far. The, the, the birth of that idea in terms of a breathing building um, goes back to our Comets Bank headquarters in, um, in Frankfurt and the techniques, the research techniques that we've developed to be able to, uh, to predict the, uh, the, 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 the climate in terms of wind studies and, um, and the sketch here showing how gardens are introduced vertically into the building as part of the ecology of the building. And there we're, um, we're looking down on one of the gardens, and on the right, it's what you would, um, it's what you would see if you, um, if you were using one of the gardens for coffee or whatever. It's quite interesting to see the relationship between the sketch that I did on the right at the time of the competition for that project and the uh, lady who occupies a, a similar place in the building. And you can see that even opening 
internally into the courtyard, you can see that the, the windows are open. And, and really, the, the working community here makes their collective decision about the degree to which um, this is, is, is fresh air mixed with the, with the condition there. And um, the image that I showed of, um, of Buckminster Fuller and myself was in a building called the Sainsbury Centre. And apart from being great patrons of the arts and discovering artists like Bacon and Giacometti and more when nobody had ever heard of them and buying their work for, um, well, that's another story. Um, Lisa Sainsbury was during the war. She headed out the nursing uh, association in, in, in London and they created a, um, through that, a, an experimental wing and um, by one of those very bizarre coincidences, I found myself um, having to have major uh, surgery for cancer and ended up in the Robert and Lisa Sainsbury wing at the hospital. And, um, and the photograph on the left is the room. And what was interesting is that Lisa Sainsbury placed tremendous emphasis on the fact that when you walked into the room, you shouldn't be able to see the bathroom. The bed should face a view. And, um, and during my stay there, I made the sketch on the right. And um, I can, although I can't quantify it, I can testify personally to the importance of having a view, having some connection with, with nature. I think it was helpful in my terms. I was in and out in, uh, in seven days. So. I'd like to think that the design was helpful there. Interestingly, that has fed back to a medical project, small hospital that we did in Bath for an American group called Humana. And again, you can see the opening window. Uh, you can see the view. And um, I got hold of this um, customer response. And at the top, it says, all the green things are kind of good. Um, and the purple is a criticism. And it's quite interesting if you just look closely at that. Um, on the green bit, it says, even the views from the room, room were stunning, no pain. And the criticism is the only point I would make is 16 pounds for half a bottle of Chablis is a bit pricey. <laughs> But I was asked, and of course I said yes, what the hell? <laughs> so I think if the complaints don't get worse than that, and the next guy says, why can't I have Sky Sports on my television? So anyway, um, the, in that same uh, small hospital, um, the contact with the outside extends to the operating theatres. And there's a rather interesting connection here with a building that we did, the BioX building in Stanford University. And here the um, many uh, of the same themes of cross-collaboration between different disciplines in this building and the ability for the users to be able to configure their own um, uh, laboratories, their own uh, test um, facilities. And that contact with the outside is also twofold. Very deliberately, the, here they wanted to open up that experience for those on the outside. So the experimentation is a kind of theater and the community of students participate deliberately looking in. These walkways also serve a double use as escape routes, so they enable much more efficient use of the space internally. And of course, it is a California climate. Um, and, um, and in that sense, it also has the open community space, which is used for these kind of academic gatherings. Also, not too far away in the same uh, Stanford orbit, uh, Silicon Valley, we have created a much larger social space in the heart of a single building, a building for uh, 12,000 uh, people. And um, 
And this space is about a, uh, a quarter of a mile across, so it's quite significant. And by making one, well, there are several buildings, but the main building is essentially one large building. But by concentrating everybody in that building, instead of dispersing them, um, uh, it enables the creation of a 175-acre park, for example. And approaching that building uh, more closely, um, that, again, this building is totally energy sufficient and also is, uh, has a high degree of natural ventilation. So working with a very benign uh, climate, um, but, but maximizing the use of that climate. So if we look at the aerial view here, this is the building site, this is the building site uh, closer up and, um, and the building as we see it envisaged in the, in the landscaping. And um, I, I realized that almost every time I saw anything in, uh, in a newspaper or a magazine about this building, it is repetitively a spaceship. And I don't know whether there's something about a circular building which is like a frisbee or a flying saucer, or, but, but somehow that space analogy is there. And, um, and some of my other passions of structures and space, and I realize that Alexander Graham Bell's experiments about the same time as the Wright brothers created these extraordinary kites which were um, which were seen really as studies for man carrying uh, vehicles and appropriately called the Stamford Taurus which in the 1970s was a uh, prediction about a space settlement in the future and that um, a mile across weighing a hundred million tons would be a community in outer space for some 10,000 inhabitants. And um, it would develop its own gravity, spinning round, uh, one revolution every minute with sunlight uh, beamed into it. And um, I then realized that in the 1990s, Architecture Viva, uh, the Spanish, extraordinarily authoritative magazine on architecture, ran a monograph of the work that we'd done in that previous 10 years. And, um, and this cartoon appeared with our Hong Kong and Shanghai bank, with the Barcelona Tower alongside it, a little bit of the Sainsbury Center there, as a kind of space launch station uh, with the objective of going to the moon. And um, they recently did another monograph, and this is the cover of the monograph, because in the last 10 years, or to be more precise, the last two or three years, uh, we've been working at the invitation of the European Space Agency to look at a lunar habitation, to collaborate with three other groups, and um, and the connection here is quite interesting because if I go back to Apple, there are two kinds of models. And it's also perhaps interesting that in this birthplace of the digital revolution, that all the presentations are essentially analog presentations. In other words, they're with physical models. And there are two kinds of models. The models that have been made for, uh, for centuries, handmade, and there's another kind of model which has come along very, very recently, and it's the um, three-dimensional printing. And it's um, you feed uh, data into a computer, and the computer feeds that into a robot, and overnight, uh, a kind of glue spitter um, builds up layer after layer, and you get these incredibly intricate models which appear the following morning. And um, because we'd invested so much research into this method of making models, we become the second largest user in the world of this technology. 
uh, working with universities and other collaborators, but essentially investing in the, in the technology. And that was the reason that they came to us, because they saw the future of the lunar habitation as harnessing this uh, technology. And so what happens here, you can see in the workshop, a very, very large um, uh, three-dimensional model maker, uh, robotic, um, and one of our collaborators has this vacuum chamber. And so the world's first um, uh, element of, uh, of three-dimensional uh, printing in a vacuum environment has been produced. And the idea is that you take a little glue out to the moon and you mix it with the moon dust on the moon's surface, which is called regolith. And that produces your building material because you can't ship um, material out. It's too expensive. Uh, the technology is not, is not there yet. And the closest you can get to moon dust on the Earth planet is volcanic lava. So uh, we have been developing uh, walls that will... Uh, this is, uh, is a sample made with volcanic lava. And, um, and there is a small film that we made here that just tries to convey some of those technologies. Uh, you can't send heavy stuff, bulky stuff, out in space. So everything has to be as small as possible. And, um, and the, the delivery vehicle itself becomes part of the lunar habitation. So the top of this, which is the chamber into which you will enter the habitation, it also contains all the support facilities, so the package kitchens, WCs, um, and it inflates the chassis upon which the building will be created. That's an inflatable structure. And then this little robot comes along. It has a scoop that will scoop up the dust. It has tanks, which is the glue, the binding, binding agent. And it has a three-dimensional printer, which can sculpt and the patterns are based on animal bone structures, which are the strongest cellular structures. So that's directly influenced from nature. Here you can see it's scooped up the regolith, the moon dust. It's mixing it with the glue. It's sculpting it and then speed it up. That is about 10 feet thick because it has to withstand attacked by meteorites, which are 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet. And it has to create an environment which takes into account a range of temperature from 212 degrees Fahrenheit plus to 274 degrees minus. It's on the southern part, the southern pole of the moon next to the Shackleton crater, which has continuous sunlight. And the sunlight is beamed in through these connections with the world outside. And there you can see that the entrance is the top part of the lunar module, which is now part of the inhabitation. And of course, you've got the equipment there, so if a structure gets damaged, you don't have to go back to Earth to repair it, because you've got the moon dust, you've got the robot, and you've got the, uh, some of the binder left. And the, it occurred to me in the early days of this project that the next inevitable stage was, was that buildings would be built this way. And lo and behold, in May this year, in China, I found that they made the first 10 houses and they used a, instead of a machine like the one that you saw next to the guy operating with the computer, this machine is 100 feet long, it's two stories high, it's 30 foot wide, and they made the first 10 houses with the 
uh, with the printing technology. So, thank you. Norman, I can't thank you enough. That was a wonderful trip that took us, I, by my estimation, about 300 years uh, from uh, the initial uh, architectural uh, renderings that you showed us to at least, uh, at least 10 years into the future. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. I've got about 100 questions I'd like to ask, but in lieu of having a, a very intelligent audience and appreciative audience here, I'd like to start with the questions from the audience. So why don't you start over here? It's right over this, this gentleman. Uh, hi, I'm Shiva. Thank you, Lord Foster, for your artistic insights today. It was nice to witness beautiful creations so far you have met. I have a question. What's your favorite creation so far and why? My favorite? Favorite building. Favorite creation so far? Oh, gosh. That's a bit like saying, name your favorite child. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> um, in a way, it's, it's, it's different buildings for perhaps different reasons. The Sainsbury Center I, I, I showed was, um, was very special. It was the first public building and also the um, Sir Robert and Lady Sainsbury became Bob and Lisa and were almost like parents. Um, uh, the, the building which I think probably has more ticks in more boxes uh, in terms of ecology being virtually um, zero waste, uh, zero carbon, of being about collaborating with artists, with history, symbolism, is, is the Reichstag. Um, but but there are you know, different buildings for, for, for different reasons. Uh, that, I think, is, that stands out uh, because it, 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 it is so, so encompassing of so many different things that a building can be about. It's become a symbol of Berlin. It's become a symbol of a reunified uh, Germany. It's become a public space in the sky. Um, and, um, and it's evolved out of the very mechanism of democracy itself, uh, which was quite an agonizing process, because if you could imagine a political body about the size of this gathering, and everybody's been brought up to disagree with each other, and on the one occasion, they all have to find common agreement. So um, you can imagine the, uh, uh, was a, quite a challenging process. And over here? Thank you, Lord Foster, for your time. Uh, my name is Brian Kaufman. Uh, question actually was pretty similar to what he asked, so I'm gonna go with my backup. And uh, that is, I believe that every architect through their life kind of takes their experiences and um, the people that they, they interact with and they use that to design and uh, kind of establish their process. Um, I guess in your life, who is probably the, who's had the biggest impact or what's been the biggest event in your life that's kind of helped you to um, kind of reach your process or the way you approach a project? Um, I think I'd say that, uh, that, that the, um, the people who have and continue to be the most important are those who, uh, who have a creative spark and who really care about uh, about a project, whether they're almost on the receiving end, whether they're uh, the clients that one works with or the collaborators, the engineers, um, uh, colleagues. Uh, I, I, I would say that that continues to be, in a way, design for me is, a, is, is an interesting mixture. I, I, I really need people to spark off. Um, but I also need the solitude of the bicycle as well and the sketchbook. And, um, uh, but in terms of individuals, Buckminster Fuller has to be a very important individual. Um, but others who are not necessarily architects, one individual called Otto Leiker, who I, um, who I sought out as a designer, graphic designer, at the time of the Hong Kong Bank. 
And, um, and he became a very dear friend and a great collaborator. And a bit like Bucky, was almost more of a philosopher than a designer. And uh, so, so individuals who can cross boundaries, I would try and sum it up as. Thank you uh, for a great uh, presentation today, uh, and especially your insight that the past can inspire about the future projects for architects. Um, one of the best creation on this planet is probably the human body, and I, I'm sure you would agree with that. Uh, has human body ever inspired you for some kind of a project? That's one thing, and as an extension of that, do you think that the architects should be taking some giving some classes to the medical students to learn from architects, and vice versa, physician may be inspiring the architects. Uh, should there be collaboration between the two fields? I think it would be great to have that interaction. Um, uh, it's totally in the spirit of what I was saying in terms of crossing boundaries. Um, the, I think that the, the, the human analogy is, is constant. I mean, it, the, any consideration about the scale of a building is relative to, uh, to the human body. And, um, and we were talking earlier about the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright um, and his prairie houses and the Midwest and the horizontality. <coughs> and of course, if you, um, if, if you experience any of those uh, houses, he, um, always compress you on the entrance to the house, and then the house would generally explode around the hearth. And even going into the Guggenheim Museum in, uh, in New York, you go through a, a space which is almost seven feet high, and everybody goes through it before they explode into the great vertical uh, space. So I'd say that with, with, in the presence of all great architecture, it's all about exploiting the relationship of the human. And again, no accident that we use human terminology in terms of describing our projects. So we all talk about the importance of this spine uh, in the master plan, the green spine. So I think it's, um, I think it's a very valid point. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming tonight and sharing your knowledge with us. <laughs> When working on this new project in Cleveland, do you go back to any of your previous designs or previous projects and kind of take stuff from those projects to design? Sorry? That, 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 no, do you go back to your previous projects as you think about the project here in Cleveland? Um, I think that one's relating all the projects together in one way or another. And, um, and I tried to show the relationship between some of these projects which, although they look very different because they're for very different functions in different places, different parts of the world, they are all linked by a series of, if you like, uh, priorities, um, um, design considerations, obsessions. Um, uh, so, uh, so in that way, they're even if they're not consciously linked, I think they're subconsciously linked. Great. One more over here. Hi. Um, I, you were talking and expanding about uh, 3D printing, and I was just wondering, you talked about how you're 3D printing on the moon, but I was wondering what, um, how you think 3D printing will change in like, the future of architectural design. Well, I think that, um, that, that, that buildings will inevitably um, feed off other technologies wherever they're applicable. And, um, and the sourcing of buildings has become much more global. So uh, I felt that the... Chinese example was a very strong taste of things to come, where robotics would play an ever-increasing role, where uh, the, 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 the one thing that I've never thought of before is that, is that the tendency has been to make more and more 
the building off site. So the site becomes an assembly point for things that have been made in factories here, there, and everywhere, globally sourced. Of course, the whole, uh, and the, the Chinese example does raise questions in some people's mind because they say it's not really the world's first um, uh, building produced by three-dimensional printing because a lot of the pieces have been made off-site. So that suggests the prospect of a building being made on-site by three-dimensional printers, robotically controlled, which in a funny kind of way would be a complete revolution of history would bring us back to a point in time where buildings were constructed on the site and not prefabricated off the site. I think we'll, we'll see more of those tendencies and also the instance where I invoked the solar aircraft. I think that um, we'll look back on the present period as a transition period, a bit like um, when the first cars were horseless carriages, and they looked like the carriage without the horse. Um, and you still see the derivation of that in terms of horsepower and the engine under the hood and, 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 and so on. But I think that, um, I th I think that, the, um, that, the, the, that the, the building structures will integrate the energy harvesting as part of the structure. And already in Apple, we're making huge pieces of structure which have tubes embedded in them through which we run hot or cold water so the whole slab becomes hot or cold so there are no visible radiators um, and minimum air movement apart from that shown on the diagram. I think a lot of these tendencies over time will change, will change the buildings, will change the environment. And, and I think my biggest hope was that will be that we will be able to have even better quality environments, but at a fraction of the energy consumption and pollution. I see one more uh, verdant question up there, so go for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to express the joy I've felt in visiting some of your buildings, the, the London Airport or the British Museum Rotunda, the Portrait Gallery. Uh, if you want to talk a little more about joy as uh, trying to create joy for the users. Yes. And, and the other part is, what happens to your architects when they turn 33? <laughs> <laughs> they hang around like me. <laughs> I think joy is an is, is a absolutely burning essential element and um, and if I sh gave you a word picture of some of the uh, buildings like the Willis Faber building that we did in the 1970s um, it had a swimming pool that everybody would use since then um, the town has grown up around it it has all those uh, facilities so that's been kind of um, made over but again, the whole roof is a, is a garden. The colors are uh, greens, yellows. Um, it is about uh, a sense of celebration of joy. The same motivation was behind the idea of the spiraling ramp and the cafe and the terraces and opening up the roof of the, of the, of, of the Reichstag to, to the public. And um, that was a very interesting debate because uh, a number of politicians said, why would anybody ever want to go up on the roof of the Reichstag? Um, and why would they want a coffee when they got there? And then, <laughs> and then the next complaint was, the architects didn't plan sufficiently, it's too small. Um, uh, so, so yes, I mean, I think that we've, we, we do bring to the, to the project even if it's not asked for, uh, those ingredients. And I think they permeate uh, through, through all of the schemes. We're doing a small uh, charity project at the moment for Maggie's, a cancer um, charity. Uh, and, um, 
and doing a project in, in Manchester. And um, I was taken round all the other centres that they, that they have, and, um, and I noticed that there were never any flowers in any of these centres. And uh, so really almost pushing at an open door uh, with, um, with uh, Charles Jenks, who is the, uh, whose late wife died and was called Maggie, and so these buildings are uh, in her memory, and saying, you know, why don't we make a, a greenhouse, an integral part of, the, of this centre in Manchester? So it is part of the, the therapy, and the products uh, will then decorate and bring another dimension. I mean, it's the same ingredient of, of joy. So yes, I'll make, uh, from now on, I will introduce that into future talks. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry that I know that we've got lots more, but I think joy is a great place to end, and you have provided that for us over the last hour. I can't thank you enough, and I want to thank you for being here, for the uh, talent that you have brought to developing our new health education campus. Uh, it has been fabulous uh, to have this hour with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, <clears throat> I was going to say behind any great architectural venture, there's a great client. So I, I, I say thank you to you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> and thank you all. <clears throat>